good to see all of you this morning. And we welcome you here to this time of worship. And those of you who join us online, we welcome you as well. And we will begin our service this morning with uh, hymn 93 in our hymnals here. Come, thou fount of every blessing. So, Lord Jesus, we welcome you this morning and and pray that we would truly focus on all that you have to share with us. The words of truth that you have to reveal to us this morning, the inspiration, the hope, the power, and the promise 
that you bring to the hearts and lives of your people, we embrace. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to truly open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to be able to hear what you would say to us, to recognize truth and opportunities to serve you when we see it. And to know, Lord Jesus, that you truly love us, sometimes in spite of ourselves, but you love us. So help us embrace the forgiveness that you have offered, that we may go from this place, Lord, and from this time together, freed from the guilt of sin, living joyful lives, sharing your peace with those around us. For we know, Father, that, that joy is contagious. Let that be the thing that motivates us as your people to rejoice in the salvation you have given us, to rejoice in the truth that your word reveals to our lives, to rejoice in the opportunities you give us to serve you by serving others who are in need. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling this morning. We pray for this family who has, has lost all that they had and just ask God that your people surround them now and, and rise up and come to their aid. We pray for those who are struggling with illness, those who are recovering, Lord, from, from surgeries and from accidents, and we pray healing upon their bodies, their minds, and their spirits. Those who grieve, Father, we pray that you would enfold them in your loving arms, that you would comfort them and bring promise and hope and peace to their hearts again. And remind us daily, Lord, of the calling that we have to be good stewards of the grace you have poured out on us, that we may recognize the opportunities to join you in ministry, to share with those around us, to encourage them, to bless them, to witness and testify to them to the difference it makes when you are truly Lord of our lives. And so as we continue to worship this morning, Father, we offer before you the prayer that your son Jesus taught his disciples to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is number five in our hymnals here. Come ye that love the Lord.
I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please be seated. If the ushers will come forward at this time, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, as we come now bringing our tithes and our gifts, we're so thankful for the many ways in which you bless us. I pray, Lord, that we give as freely and joyfully as we receive from you, that your word may go forth and that your work continue within this community and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured it. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then moving to the 18th verse. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately it stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word understands it, and who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Please be seated. The point of this story as we go through it and of this message as I bring it this morning is quite simply is it well with your soul? Is it? Now, the story is called the parable of the sower. If you look in your Bibles, you know they like to put little bold headlines above different sections, and they'll say the parable of the sower and the seed, etc., etc. But when I preached on this text in past years, I'm sure you remember me telling you that this isn't a parable about the sower at all. This isn't a parable about the seed. This is a parable about dirt. It's a parable about the soil that the seed falls on. This is a parable of the church. It's a parable about you. This is your part in salvation. How you prepare your mind, your heart, and your spirit to receive the Word of God. Now, if you were going to see some important person, some bank president or, or congressman, or you're going to go and see a senator or the president of the United States, you'd make a little bit of preparation, wouldn't you? You'd be prepared to, to meet them and, and for that encounter, right? But how much did you prepare your heart, your mind, your spirit before you came to worship this morning? 
How much did you prepare yourself to be in the presence of Jesus Christ during this hour? Jesus said, where two or more of you gather in my name, I will be there in the midst of you. And if we believe Christ, we know his word is sure and he is here, present in this place, in this moment with us. Did you prepare for this? Are you ready for what his Holy Spirit is going to strive to reveal to you? For the seed that he needs to plant in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, for you to take with you that's going to strengthen you in your spiritual journey, that is going to move you forward in your spiritual growth and understanding, that's going to help you discern where to be at work and in ministry in the community around you with people that you're going to meet this coming week. Word that's going to put seed in your hearts to strengthen you for the tasks that you have. And Jesus talks about four conditions of the heart with regards to the word. And all four are determined by you, by the individual. How committed are you to the work of the kingdom? How prepared are you to truly hear what Jesus has to teach you? How willing are you to listen to the instruction of the Holy Spirit so that you can bear fruit for God's kingdom? Because we need to be very clear about this. Make no mistake, church. No fruit, no heaven. Got that? No fruit, no kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit is cut off and cast into the fire. He's not talking about atheists. He said, every branch in me. It's the church. It's not enough just to proclaim or to say. You've got to believe it. You've got to act on it. You have to live it. You have to embrace it. And any one of these conditions could be the condition of our heart on any given day. Okay? This is not only personality descriptions of people who really need their whole personality change, because it is that too. But it's also a warning to each of us that we can get so caught up in different things that any one of these could describe us on any given Sunday morning when we come into worship or show up for a Bible study. And the first that he describes is the hardened heart. This is the seed that falls by the wayside on the pathways where people's feet have trodden and it's become hard packed. And it's easy for us to, to let life make us hardened, isn't it? To become negative and, and cynical about things. And there are a lot of people who are cynical about everyone and everything. You know, they never see a goal or an opportunity. They're always looking for the hidden agenda, right? Somebody offers them a compliment and they see it as manipulation. What do they want? Hmm. What are you, what are you really after? You offer them uh, a new idea and the, they're the first ones to say it'll never work. Right? Throw a wet blanket on everything that, that the church is trying to do. But it can also be us at different times in our lives. When we let a bad experience that happened to us during the week or, or something that hurt our feelings or some issue harden our heart and make us forget why we're here in this place. We bring that in with us and we don't leave it. And so it's what's running through our minds and, and, and we're just so hardened in our hearts that the word just can't take root and we miss it that day. We miss that opportunity. We don't embrace Christ in this place and, and in this time that we have. And then there are those whose hearts are so hardened, but they're in church all the time. Only they're not there to hear the word of God. They're there to find out what they need to criticize this week. You ever known anybody like that? Let me tell you something. They are out there. In 39 years of ministry, I have pastored churches 
that there were people who came to church for the specific purpose of going out the next day. Did you see who was sitting with so and so? Did you see what so and so wore? And then there are the holier than the preachers. You know? He missed this. He should have said that. He should, I cannot believe the hymns that we sang. That's who picked those things for us to say. Good grief. Didn't they? Didn't they? They never heard the word that Jesus was trying to get to them. <coughs> they were never open to the movement of the Holy Spirit in that time. They were too busy looking for what to criticize. Hardened heart. The gospel cannot take root in that heart at that time and the seed is lost. The second one he described as the shallow heart. Ooh, I've known a lot of folks like that too. There's a little bit of work done, but not a whole lot. Because they really aren't going to put a whole lot into this. But they know it's important, but I'm, you know. The soil is rocky and shallow. These, Jesus said, they might be great starters, but they'll never stay the course. Not seriously. This kind of person initially embraces the excitement of the word, but they're going to retreat from any hint of sacrifice. When you start saying it's going to require some sacrifice, it's like, nope, not me. That's somebody else's department. And they'll abandon the faith when things don't go right. These are the ones who I go and visit and say, look, I hear you used to be a member of the church. Well, God wasn't there for me when I needed him. I prayed, 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 prayed. God never answered my prayer. Yeah, he did. He told you no. Because it was the wrong thing for you. At the wrong moment. I told God so and so and so. I said, wait a minute, I'm sorry, you did what? <laughs> you told God what he needed to do? My, my, my. Do you hear what you're saying? But they lose faith because everything didn't fall out the way they wanted to because they're so shallow they don't understand what real spirituality is. They don't understand how God truly works. And they've never made the effort to plow a little deeper, to prepare their heart and their soul and their spirit a little better to really hear what the Lord's trying to tell them. They want the gift of eternal life. They want the blessings. They want the peace. They want the joy. But they're not willing to pay the cost. They're not willing to put the effort in that it takes to really study the Word, to really get into Jesus' teachings and then to act on what they've read, on what they've heard, on what the Spirit is encouraging them to do. And they give up when they're challenged. When, when trouble comes, they got somewhere else to be. Right? They're not going to get in there and work to solve problems in the church. They're going to run from them. We have to be careful not to fall in that trap that, well, that's somebody else's department, not mine, right? I come, I sit, I worship, and I go home. But that's not the Christian way. That's not what Christ calls us to do. He calls us to have prayerfully and carefully prayed and thought about what we're fixing to do. We're fixing to worship Almighty God in this space at this moment with Christ himself present among us. The Holy Spirit poured out on us. And oh, what God has to tell us this morning. What he has to share with us. The things that he has to show us and to do within us. And to call us to go and do and be. And we should be excited about that. We should be ready for that. But for a lot of these whose hearts are, are so shallow, Satan brings little doubt a little trouble, a little disappointment, and they're gone. No fruit. And then there's the distracted heart that Jesus decided. The one where the weeds came up and choked out the word that had a really good chance of bearing fruit. It came up. But worry and wealth conspired to destroy that seed before it could bear any fruit. These people mean well. You know, start off with determination and, and with 
grand intentions, but other things start to take precedence over church and their service and their work. And so gradually the things of God are forced out to make room for the things they think they need to get done, that, that other people are telling them that they should be doing in order to be successful, right? For some, the worry and busyness of life just chokes out the fruit of the word within us. Don't take time for prayer or reflection on what the Spirit has spoken into our heart through a sermon that we heard, through a, a special of fire sang, through a hymn that we sang, through something that we read in our studies of the Scriptures. Or we get so busy, we say, well, I just don't have time to study the Scripture. Let me tell you something. This life is temporary. You hear that? You're going to die. Every single one of you are going to die, as am I. This life is going to go, and then eternal life is going to begin. Which do you think is more important that we're prepared for? Storing up stuff here that we're not going to take with us, or making sure that we're doing the things God has called us to do so that we have a life there. No fruit, no heaven. We need to get our spiritual priorities in order and stay focused. But for some people, they get so distracted by all of that stuff, all of that busyness, that they don't make time that they need for the study and the prayer and the worship of the Lord so that the word can take root in their heart and can bear fruit. People like this find more to worry about than they find to give thanks for. They find more reasons to be depressed than they find reasons to celebrate. And the reason is because their vision is cast down. They're focused on this life and the stuff and all that, and they never lift their eyes up to Christ to see how he's calling them to rise above all of this stuff. To live, as Paul said, in the spirit and not in the flesh so that we can embrace the joy and the promise and the peace and the strength that Jesus offers us. But there are also, in this group of people with distracted hearts, the one whose possessions become the focus of life. They live to work, to buy and to have, and that's the center of life. What am I going to get out of this? What can I amass? And this is what makes me successful. And their focus is on a different God. Because make no mistake, church, the thing that you pour your heart into that is most important to you in this life, that's your God. And if it's not Jesus Christ and his word and what the Holy Spirit is calling you to do in his presence with you in this life, then what do you adore? What is it that you cherish? What is it that you are devoting your life to if not Jesus Christ? Our possessions can either be a tool or they can become an idol to us. Either we master our wealth that God has blessed us with and use it to serve God by serving others or that wealth will be our master. And a lot of us suffer from junk overload, you know. It's not that we're doing bad things, but that the stuff we have become our source of pride. You know, they become how we judge our status. And they become the focus and drive in our life to attain more, to have more. And it blinds us to the needs of others around us. And when we become more dependent on stuff, on mammon, as Jesus called it, when we become more dependent on that than we do on God, then that seed can't take place in our heart to bear fruit for his kingdom. But there is the last type. There is that fourth type of soil, and we need to focus on doing this, and that's the heart that is 
open, that's prepared, that's ready to hear what Jesus has to say, that's ready to receive what the Holy Spirit has to bring and to offer so that we can hear it and embrace it and act on it. I know a lot of those distracted hearts, those worried hearts, that, and, and, and I'm saying this from experience. I've had the word spoken to me. I, I just am not willing to open myself to that Holy Spirit, preacher, because what if he calls me to go be a missionary to the Congo? What if he sends me to Africa? And I looked at him and I said, I promise you right now, he ain't sending you to Africa to do his word. But you might be sending yourself to hell. That's not what he's going to do. God doesn't take you and then make you miserable in his service, church. Jesus said, I have come that your joy might be full. That's what he said. I've come to give you life and life abundant. So you're cheating yourself out of that joy, out of the abundant life that God has for you if you're not opening yourself and letting the Holy Spirit fill you and direct you and bless you. The prepared heart is open and expectant when we come to worship, when we come to Bible study, when we open our Bibles at home to read Jesus' teachings and see what he has to share with us in our hearts. This type of hearer has tilled the soil with prayer. They prep it so that it's fertile through their studies of the scripture and they're ready to receive that seed from God and bear fruit for him. And Jesus mentions this one last because it's the focus of this parable. The good soil and how to make sure our hearts are ready to hear what the Lord has to share with us. And true, there are failures. There are always going to be some failures, but the good news is that there are also victories. And the victories are always greater than the failures. And Jesus explained that this last type of soil is the person who hears the word of God and then acts on the word. Not just listens, but then acts on that word that they have heard. And they go and they share love and they share peace and they make a difference and they do good. Some of you are old enough, as I am, to remember some of you are not, so just listen and go, wow, they used to do that, okay? But when Walter Cronkite was anchored on the CBS News, you remember? The CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite, you remember that? And they introduced the segment on that called On the Road with Charles Courant. You might remember that. Well, in his first episode, as he did that, and on the road, this was about human interest stories, okay? Introduce that into the news to, to look at some positive things in life. And as Corral was trying to uh, decide, you know, what he was going to do for his first segment and everything else, he recalled having driven through Stanton, Virginia, 12 years before and was so impressed he had never forgotten it because as he was driving through there, he came on this gorgeous roadside park and he stopped to, to, to get out and just walk and look and as he was walking and looking, what he discovered was that it was 50 acres of the most beautiful park he had ever seen. There were winding paths lined with tulip. There were thousands of azaleas everywhere. The, the grounds were just manicured, beautiful hardwood trees and everything was carefully tended to. And he said, I wondered then how huge the maintenance crew must be that they were paying to keep all of these grounds up. Well, as he was wandering around there, he bumped into an old man and began a conversation with him and found out that it was kept up by that one single old man who was at that time 83. He owned a nursery there in Stanton. And he was a devout Christian and he had been raised by his parents to believe if you don't leave this world a better place than it was when you came into it, then what was the purpose of your life? And so his gift to the world, his gift to life was this part. 
that people had a place to come and stop and just contemplate it and just experience God in nature. And so he had been working on it for 20 years, dedicated and loving. But he was a widower and he had no children. And Charles Corral asked him, he said, well, what's going to become of this when you're gone? And he said, well, I, I don't know. I hope it doesn't go to weeds and, and brambles again like it was when I started. And now here it was 12 years later, and Corral decided he was going to take his, his uh, videographer, his cameraman, and go back to Stanton just to see what had happened to that park. It might make for a good story. It might not. He knew that the old gentleman that had done all of this had died four years <coughs> before uh, because some of the people there had sent him news clippings of the man's obituary. So he wondered as they were driving down the road what he was gonna find when he got to that place. Well, much to his surprise and delight, he found that the garden was intact and it was more beautiful than ever. And he was wondering, wow, well, what, what happened when that old man passed away, you know? And so he was walking through there and, and looking at everything and, and he, he saw this Korean lady that was over there, you know, snipping some, uh, things off the azalea bushes and he walked over and, and spoke to her and come to find out that 11 years before she had driven by that park and was so impressed she turned around and came back and probably got up and was and was just walking in the front of it and just sat down in the grass just to look and she met the old man and told him, you know, I live in a little apartment. You know, I work in a, in a cleaners. And I don't have any space in that apartment in that big city on the west coast to grow anything. Not that it would grow in all the smog anyway. And this is just so beautiful. And, and I love working with plants and flowers and everything. I just, I just wish there were somewhere for me to do this at home. And he just insisted on taking her and showing her the whole park and, and talking about everything with her. And he recognized her love for, for nature. And so a couple of weeks after she had gotten back in her apartment in that, that city on the West Coast, she got a phone call from him. And he pleaded with her to come and to live in his guest house. And he said, if you'll come and live in this guest house when I'm gone, I want to give you the nursery on the promise that you'll take care of that garden. And she said, I didn't have to think about it very long. And I took him up on that offer. And I moved out of that squalid little apartment and left all of that mess on the West Coast. And I came and I moved into that guest house and he taught me the business there in the, uh, the nursery. And, and I've worked in his garden ever since. And as she stood there talking to Corral, explaining her story, and his videographer was taping all of this, she said, you know, she said, next to my mother, no person in my life ever showed so much love to me as that old gentleman did. And Charles Corral concluded that segment by saying, where the seed of love is planted, only good fruit comes forth. Why are you here? What did you come to see? Did you expect to be inspired, challenged, empowered by the Holy Spirit while you were here? Because when we prepare our hearts to receive the seed that the Spirit is sowing in us, then it's going to bring love and hope and strength and joy and peace and a focused determination to go and spread that love, to go and share that word, that hope, that promise with others. This is your parable, church. We are the ones who come service after service and sit. For the God seed even has a chance in our hearts each time is entirely up to us. How prepared are you for worship? How well do you prayerfully pray for your Bible study at home? Are you producing fruit for the kingdom of God? Because when we are, that seed will root 
and, and it will produce fruit faster than you could imagine. And one other thing I hope you get from this. Jesus is telling us that goodness still has a great chance in this life, church. Love still has a chance in this life because we are still here. God's church is still here. It's up to us. The way is hard. There are obstacles. It requires sacrifice. And granted, more often than not, that seed's going to fall on some rocky ground, on some, on some stony, shallow soil, maybe wind up getting choked out. But some of it is going to fall on fertile ground, and there's going to be an abundant harvest from that. So how is it with your soul today? Is it fertile? Is it open? Is it excited? Is it expecting? Is it joyful? Is it determined to take what God will share with you and go bear fruit for his kingdom? Because when you determine to do that, God is more determined to bless you, to open the windows of heaven and give you more than you ever thought you could have. You can't out-love a God. Our closing hymn is 205. All the way my Savior leads me.
on the truth of your calling on our lives to take the love that you have poured upon us and go and share it with others, that they may see the difference it makes when you are truly Lord of our lives. Send us forth now with your grace and your peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen.